Okay, so until <clears throat> yesterday, we introduced the equations for the Hopkins network. We introduced the update rule. Right, you have n neurons, each neuron is connected to every other neuron, and you have a weight matrix. And you start from initial condition and then uh, apply this update equation. And uh, this system state evolves through time and uh, it will converge. And the con conditions for convergence, uh, we have uh, derived that with the help of an energy function. We showed that there is an energy function which keeps going down as the evolution of the state progresses. And since the energy function is bounded, this evolution has to right, converge and uh, stabilize in some equilibrium states, right, in some minima of this energy function. So the minima of the energy function, which are attractors, uh, are the stable states of this uh, dynamics of this network. So these attractors act like memories. So we'll see, let's see how, we, how, that, how that happens. So the attractors are memories. If you have energy function, which has some minima, so a bunch, let's say this network has three memories. This energy function has three memories. So this is a stored pattern S1, stored pattern S2, stored pattern S3. Right? So if I start from anywhere in this neighborhood, I land here and so on and so forth. So now the, the minima of the energy function are somehow defined by the weight matrix because energy function is a function of the state of the network and parameterized by the weight matrix. So what are information is there in the energy function is all contained in the parameters, the weight, the weight parameters. So if I want the energy function to have minimum at this vector S1, this vector S2, this vector S3, you have to somehow incorporate that S1, S2, S3, right? You have to feed it into the weight matrix, somehow right, encode all this information to the weight matrix. So how do you do that? Right, this is where you need a storage rule. How do you store information into the weight matrix? So basically, how do we construct, how do you get this weight matrix, right? So what we want is, let's take only one pattern. I want to have a store, I uh, need to store a pattern uh, S in the weight matrix. Now S is a binary variable, which means S i is equal to plus or minus one. It's a binary vector. Storing it in the weight matrix means I want the energy function to be a minimum Energy V of W uh, must have must have a minimum at V is equal to S. So right when you go to V is equal to S, E should be minimum. So E should be like this. So if this is E function and this is a variable V, right? So this should be V equal to S. At this point, E should have minimum. And note that E is a quadratic function. So I want a quadratic function, which becomes a minimum, uh, at uh, goes to its minimum at V equal to S. What could that function be? Can somebody guess? E is a quadratic function, right, of vector V, which goes to minimum at V equal to S. What could that function be? And this is a V equal to S is also a quadratic function. So one good one guess, right, is uh, is equal to so it's only a guess. Is equal to mod of the norm of V minus S square. Right, obviously this is a quadratic function, and it becomes uh, zero at uh, V equal to S, and you know you can easily see that at V equal to S e is minimum, right. But there's a small problem with this expression because norm of V minus S, uh, right, norm whole square. If you expand it, it will become mm, V minus S transpose times V minus S. Okay, so this will have uh, V transpose S plus S, tra sorry, V transpose V plus S transpose S minus s transpose v minus v transpose s so you see that this v transpose v since v is a binary vector v transpose v is just equal to n okay s, s transpose s is also binary s is a binary vector so s transpose s is n so this whole thing i can i can write as two times because s transpose v and v transpose s both are, both are the same 
I can write as S transpose V. So what happened is what we thought will be a quadratic expression, right? In this special case where the V and S are both binary vectors, it became a linear expression. So the expression will not have a minimum, right? At, uh, I mean, so, so the simple rule, simple what we expected, uh, it kind of uh, fell apart because it's uh, it has a minimum because S and V are bounded, but uh, it's not at uh, S equal to V. So, so there is a small problem. So this expression is not the best expression. So what is the right expression? Let us see this. So one more guess that you can take. So I'll call this guess number one. So let us consider another expression. Guess number two, which is S dot V whole square. Okay, so S dot V is a, um, a dot product and S and V are, uh, have, have a fixed norm because both are in binary vectors. Therefore, S dot V will be maximum when S equal to V. So this is good. And you are looking at the square of that. And this will be maximum when S equal to V. And then we'll consider minus of that. And this expression will be minimum at X equal to V. So that is good. And this we can also write as equal to S transpose V uh, times S transpose V, or we can also write it as minus of V transpose S times S transpose V. So this can be written as minus of V transpose S S transpose times V. Okay, so if you look at this, exp the last expression, it's an identical form as our energy function. So let us see how that works out. So energy, if I write energy function like this, right? Uh, as ten, you know, basically some factor minus of some factor time, positive factor times. Uh, sigma SIV, that is S dot V, right? Uh, whole square. Then if you expand this out into, write it out as a product of two summations. So sigma SI, SI, uh, sigma over I, SIV, times sigma over J, SI, SJ, VJ. Then if you multiply this out term by term, these two products, right, you get uh, minus half times one over N, SI, SJ times VI, VJ, right? You see this expression is as identical form as our energy function. The energy function has minus half times sigma, sigma, WIJ, VI, VJ. Here also you have minus half times uh, sum over, so sigma, 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 sigma over IJ some factor times vi vj so this factor happens to be the weight matrix in the energy function so therefore if you define your weight matrix as this expression then the, res the resulting weight matrix and the resulting Hopfield network uh, will have a minimum at uh, v equal to s so so therefore this is a storage rule storage rule is if you want to store a pattern s right Calculate your weight matrix such that the W i j term in the weight matrix is equal to equal to one over n, this factor one over n, at times S i S j. So a given weight between the ith neuron and the jth neuron, W i j. Right. If I want to store the pattern such that the bit here is S i, and the bit here is S j, then basically take the product of these two bits and set it to the weight of the, the current the connection between the two very simple rule so this was the kind of uh, similar to the kind of the rule that was kind of envisioned by donald Hebb way back in his book uh, of 1949 right and hopefield basically has given it a kind of mathematical uh, form and proposes rule so if you want to store one pattern this is the rule if you want to store multiple patterns sp Right, so P is the index of our pattern. So P goes from one to some, let's say capital P. Capital P is number of patterns. So then you take many such terms, uh, one term for each pattern, and then add them up. That's, that's how you calculate the weight matrix. So you can express the storage rule or Hebb's rule, right, uh, in two different ways. One is single element form. So the single element of the matrix WIJ is given as one by n times SISJ. So this for single pattern, right? And the, for multiple pattern storage, again, for single, the single element form, 
wij is equal to 1 by n times uh, spi spj okay, and then use this you sum over all the patterns in the matrix form the same thing it looks a lot more elegant right it's 1 over n times ss transpose ss transpose note that it's an outer product right if you if you take product of two vectors in the outer product form you will get a matrix and uh, same thing in the for multiple pattern storage it is 1 over n times uh, sigma of sp sp transpose so sp is the uh, pth pattern so here we can uh, contrast the way things work in mlp with the way things work in hopkin network <clears throat> in mlp the state update is instantaneous that is you give an input so in case of an mlp you have a network you give an input x you get the output y which is instantaneous there's no the state update doesn't take any time whereas in the hopkin network when you give an input <clears throat> to produce the final output you need to iterate through uh, through the network for a few steps before it stabilizes and returns your uh, complete pattern therefore state update is iterative Sim similarly wait update in mlp is iterative because you apply uh, you present the pattern back propagate the error and do it over and over again for many data for many patterns whereas in hopkin network it is instantaneous i just present the pattern and instantaneously i calculate the weights using this ebs rule this formula there is some kind of a differences between mlp and the hopkin network similarly the, the update rule also can be given in single uh, element form or matrix form right uh, this is called online update and it's called a batch update so in this case you take one neuron at a time and update its state that's online update in this case you, you update the entire vector the vector of the state mm, the state vector uh, you update in one shot that is called a batch update the single single element form you update the ith element vi t plus 1 is equal to sigma over sigma wij vj at t okay and then you get the next value for vi uh, in the vector form it is sigma w times v the matrix times vector v right uh, so we have so seen all this you can easily see that when you just to get an intuition into how this this uh, storage rule is working if w is calculated like this if you want to store the pattern as if you calculate w like this how do we know that this is a stable pattern how do we know that the network uh, goes to is stable at this near this pattern so at least for st for stability you need two things right for stability if this is a minimum right if you start from there you shouldn't move so that's minimum condition that's not enough if you start from the neighborhood right you should get back to that point okay so two things stability means if you start at a given state you should stay there forever that only says it's an equilibrium state or a stationary state doesn't tell you that it is whether it's stable or not stability means if you part a bit from there it should come back to that state so you can easily show that uh, if you store the pattern using this rule it, it becomes a stationary state and particularly if you store only one pattern if you store multiple patterns then there's a problem we'll discuss it in a minute so vt plus 1 is sigma wv uh, and uh, if you insert w equal to the ss transpose uh, one over n is also there now so thing is since uh, sigma is the signum function a positive factor like 1 over n doesn't matter i can just ignore it uh, because it doesn't change so i'll ignore this uh, then ss transpose times v and v i initiate initialize at s so if i plug it in here i get sigma 1 over n ss transpose s now s transpose s is n right because s is a binary vector so i get sn and i can cancel n so i get sigma of s and sigma of s is s it's a sigma is a signum function so therefore if i start at v equal to s i remain there so which is good uh, we we show that v equal to s is stationary now like i said uh, hopfield himself is a physicist and he he kind of envisioned these equations by drawing analogies between the brain uh, and uh, magnetic materials 
So you know you might be thinking, what's the connection? I mean, this is totally different systems, and apparently, but uh, mathematically you found an analogy, and in fact there is one one uh, common factor because is trying to model the memory property of the brain, and magnetic materials also have the property of memory. That's what that's why you use them in your hard disk. So that's where you saw an analogy, and the analogy is like this. In a magnetic material, you have a bunch of you know, atomic magnets. They're all array, you know, arrayed on a uh, crystal axis, and each magnetic uh, this atomic magnet has a, has a binary state. They we call it the spin, in which you can give two values, plus one or minus one. Now, if you take this picture, so you have a bunch of magnets and each atomic magnets. Each magnet has a binary state, plus or minus. I can denote it as an arrow pointed left or right. So the so the each of the spins is influenced by the spins of the neighboring atomic magnets. Right? They'll be applying uh, exerting a force on the spin, making it turn one way or the other. Right. So the Net field of external you know, field acting on a given spin would be the net effect of all the other neighboring magnets on it. And if you have any other external magnetic force, and suppose you know, you remember how you try you might have tried to magnetize some uh, piece of iron, right? Just as a game in your you know in your high school days or middle school days. How do you do that? Take a piece of iron and then pass a magnet over and over again, and slowly it gets magnetized, right? So what you are doing there is initially the magnetic uh, atomic magnets are all in random directions. As you keep passing your field, you know you are kind of aligning them all in one direction. So in that case, so each of these atomic magnets is influenced by the atomic magnets in the neighborhood. In addition, it's also influenced by any field that exists and you know acting from outside the external field. So this is a well-known system. It is called an icing system. I don't know why it's called an icing. Uh, Icing system in physics, and its physics is well understood. There's a lot of work on that. So Hopfield basically did an analogy between this system and the brain. He said uh, neurons are like these atomic magnets. And just the atomic magnets have two states, plus one, minus one. Neurons also have two states: excited state or resting state, in a very in abstract sense. You know, so it's a very simple model of a neuron. And uh, the as yes, the spin of a given atomic magnet is influenced by the neighbors. The state of a neuron is influenced by the neighbors of the neuron, that is, neurons to which it is connected, All right? And then, uh, so by this interaction, by this lateral interaction, the local interactions among themselves, all these atomic magnets fall into some kind of a stable state. That, that's what we call the memory of the of the material. And uh, since it is stable, even if you put a bit a little bit, it will come back to that stable state. That's why it, it hangs on to information, All right? And in fact. Uh, what happens in a real material when you store information? You know your bits. Uh, if when you store your bits on that, uh, you know, material, magnetic material of the hard disk, the hard disk surface is divided into small region called the domains. Uh, within a domain, the spins are all aligned in one direction. So let's say this is this domain is all plus one. This domain is also plus one. This domain is minus one. This is also minus one. This is plus one, minus one. So like that, you can store one bit over a small area of this hard disk. Okay, so so he said something like like this could be going on in the brain also. That was the insight he had. So if you if you have uh, this this SI is the spin of a particle, SJ spin of a atomic magnet, then he denoted the interaction uh, strength between two neighboring atomic magnets by some kind of a coefficient called you know WIG. It's called exchange interaction strength. And so the net the net effect of a bunch of neighboring atomic magnets on the, on the ith atomic magnet is given by this expression. These are the lateral interactions, and Hx is the external field. I mean, this is how. And then you assume that there's also the, the interactions are symmetric because the force act exerted by one magnet on a neighboring magnet is equal to force exerted by the other magnet on this one. Therefore, Wih is equal to Wj. So when this is, this happens, you can write a potential energy for this whole expression. Which is a Hamiltonian, which is given by this expression, right? So he said, uh, why can't we use exactly the same mathematics and propose same mathematics uh, to a model of the brain and propose a neural network model? So that was what he has done. Basically, it's a simple reinterpretation of uh, the icing system, which but which is an quite an elegant uh, idea. 
in the process he also used hebbian learning like i said uh, earlier so the hebbian learning was proposed by hebb i think i mentioned this in the previous uh, topic briefly right he said uh, this is how the connections between neurons could be adapting themselves right that is if two neurons are active together then the connection between them should be strengthened if one is active other is not active the connection should be between them should be weakened which is more popularly described as neurons that fire together fire it together so ideas like this uh, were very were found to be quite consistent with well known animal learning ex you know, experiments like for example this famous uh, an experiment by ivan pavlov the russian phys physiologist pavlov so pavlov was working with uh, with the dog actually he originally wanted to study uh, digestion in dogs so in the process accidentally he found a very interesting effect that is uh, you need to you know in this experiment originally were they were feeding dogs with something and looking at their what happens and how to digest and things like that but what happened was so once they noticed that right so when you when you approach the animal with some food let's say with a plate of food the animal looks at the plate and salivates right because that's a natural response you see something tasty you know we salivate but so uh, once the technician who was feeding the dog noticed that even when he approaches the dog without the plate you know the meat plate but just by himself right without any meat plate see the animal sees the guy coming with his white coat and already starts salivating in anticipation of the you know the food plate the meat plate so because he the dog after repeated exposure to the technician who comes with his white coat and the meat plate has somehow associated the white coat with the meat plate and uh, start producing a response a natural response of the animal to the meat plate is salivation but uh, after some time it started responding the same way to the technician who is coming with the white coat so there is a pairing between the white coat and the meat plate so that is what uh, pavlov observed and then he wanted to study that more systematically so the direction of the research changed originally it was to study digestion in the animals in these animals and uh, he changed it uh, got transformed into a study on learning how do animals learn how do animals learn to update their stimulus response behavior so what is uh, so what happens here in this experiment is in the first set of experiments you show a stimulus like the piece of meat and look at the response of the animal so the native response of the animal to the meat is salivation okay so in the second stage of the experiment you ring a bell in addition to presenting the meat so this time the animal is exposed to meat and the bell sound simultaneously okay and after some time so this goes on for some time and so animal you now uh, uh, salivates in a kind of a joint way to the this joint stimulus of both bell and meat after some time the meat is removed and only the bell is presented right the the animal now looks at this is the bell sound and already starts salivating right so so that is animal is able to associate uh, the unconditioned the food stimulus with the bell stimulus so these were given some names the food is called unconditioned stimulus because uh, there is, so the animal got conditioned into thinking that uh, bell is also something nice you know it's, it's uh, rewarding it 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 means it implies food it indicates food right so the therefore these are called conditioning experiments these are older conditioning experiments and there there were raised late, late later uh, kind of, there were subsequent conditioning experiment which were performed and uh, they were called instrumental conditioning since these were older conditioning experiments they are called classical conditioning experiments so the original stimulus which was able to produce a response right without any prior learning or anything but this is a native an instinctive response of the animal to the stimulus so therefore this stimulus is called unconditioned stimulus this response is called unconditioned response right now what they do is uh, they present this unconditioned stimulus and also look at unconditioned response but in the, in the between they insert uh, this new stimulus right which is a neutral stimulus the bell so after that what i'm actually the present bell a little before the meat right bell first and little after the meat is presented so then after that what happens is even when the animal sees the bell ringing right uh, it starts salivating so therefore 
the the stimulus the, the new stimulus bell is called the conditioned stimulus or conditioning stimulus in some terminologies right and the new response of the animal to the bell is called conditioned response okay so this kind of a conditioning or uh, or training of the animal is called classical conditioning so an experiment like this can be very easily explained using uh, hebb's law so let us see how that is done uh, let us imagine that uh, so there is so the visual input of the meat okay let's assume assume this is a meat and so that is seen by some visual neurons or whatever you know, some some part of the brain and that is communicated to so this is this gives rise to okay my artwork is not really challenged and okay so that is supposed to be salivation okay so so there is a part of the brain which looks at the visual input of the meat and uh, because it hasn't eaten it yet it's just looked at the meat and uh, that sends a signal i don't know by some pathway to the part of the brain which produces salivation so this weight is naturally high strong right uh, because this is not trained it's already in innately present so then what happens there is another part of the brain which processes the sound of the bell okay so this is the bell and uh, this is also trying to make a connection with, with this part of the brain which produces salivation but initially this uh, this i'll call this wms w meat and salivation this is w bs right bell and salivation so initially this is weak so what you do now is you present the meat and the bell again and again over and over because you present meat and because the meat to salivation neuron connection is already strong salivation also occurs right so you 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 produce this response in this neuron you are also presenting bell so what you are doing in this experiment is the bell right and the salivation neurons are artificially made active simultaneously because of the way experiment is set up you are activating these neurons with the help of meat you are activating these neurons by presenting the bell stimulus but both are simultaneously presented so the brain seems to find a, the pathway between these two sets of neurons and strengthen them so after repeated presentation of bell and you know you know and the meat this you know was made to be simultaneously active and because of that the wbs got strengthened right because this is the essence of hebb's rule right when two neurons are made simultaneously active the connection between them should be strengthened so this what is strengthened so once this kind of pathway is strengthened then if you present the bell after that salivation occurs naturally even without the meat of course if you keep doing it the dog will understand that you are cheating it because the idea is in the original experiments after the bell the meat comes after some little delay so and the animal is only anticipating that meat is going to come any time now once the bell rings but if you keep being ring the bell and there is no meat then what happens is after some time the right the effect weakens and it stops it will stop salivate so hebbian learning was able to exp explain some of these effects which are known uh, for quite some time <coughs> because uh, carlo chexon that from like the really late 19th century carlo got a nobel prize in 1904 but his hebbs book was in the middle of 19th century so in the 1960s experiments were performed just to see if something like this actually happens uh, near uh, real synapses so in this experiment again uh, you they have taken this synapses from hippocampus a part of the brain which is involved in memory uh, activities so for this synapses uh, they have taken the presynaptic side this is a postsynaptic side they activated the presynaptic side using high, high frequency right current impulses so which is which emulates high frequency volley of action potentials so the presynaptic side is active it's highly active 
So similarly on the postsynaptic side, activating the postsynaptic side means increasing the voltage or depolarizing the membrane potential on the postsynaptic side. How do you do that? By just increasing and in, injecting a positive current or a depolarizing current. So you keep on doing it both, you know, simultaneously, right? High frequency input on the presynaptic side, depolarizing current on the postsynaptic side, keep doing it over and over again. If you do that for about 10, 15 minutes, right? And in the experimental setup, after that, even if you give a single AP on the presynaptic side, you'll get a very large postsynaptic potential, indicating that the synapse is now, uh, has now got strengthened, right? And uh, this strengthening effect will remain for hours. The experiment, the experiment, the stimulation is done only for 10, 15 minutes, right? And uh, after that, if you test the synapse, it will show its uh, increased strength for uh, several hours. This phenomenon is called long-term potentiation. They didn't want to just call it memory because that will confuse them. Because we still don't know. We still don't know that uh, if this is what is happening in memory, or this is the only thing that's happening when, when we store memories. This is very likely. There's enough evidence that this also, this also contributes to our memory. But maybe the other things. So you want to have different terms for different things. So they call this phenomenon, which is a cellular uh, and even a subcellular phenomenon, long-term potentiation. But Hebbian learning has another aspect to it. If you simultaneously activate both neurons, the connection strength should be strengthened. But if you, if you, if one of one only one side is active, other side is inactive, then the connection strength should be weakened. So how does that happen? So that also will have performed. So in this case, the presynaptic terminal is given again a high activation, high frequency action potentials. But on the postsynaptic side, they have given a negative current, which will actually decrease the membrane voltage. It will make it hyperpolarized. So therefore, this current is called hyperpolarizing current. So when you do that repeatedly, right? Uh, high frequency, uh, high overactivation on the presynaptic side, underactivation on the postsynaptic side. And happy learning says when that happens, the connection strength should be weakened. And that actually was observed. The synaptic uh, strength got weakened. And this phenomenon is called long-term depression. This is nothing to do with depression as we understand, you know, the mood and all that. This is you know, just the same term is used, but this is nothing to do with that depression. The strength is uh, depressed, so this is called LTD. So LTP and LTD together you know, are uh, can be thought to be as uh, neural substrates or neural evidence uh, for Hebbian learning. So we have seen that uh, you know when you can use if you want to store multiple patterns, that right, this is the uh, rule that we use. One by n factor. One by n factor is basically, you know, you get uh, you get a factor of n out and which get cancelled out. And we have seen that example. So it's just conventional to use one by n factor there. So you take SIP, SJP, and uh, sum it over uh, uh, all the patterns. So the thing is, if you have only one pattern, life is very, you know, things are very simple. Right? But when you use multiple patterns to store using this um, the storage rule, so you will see some problems. So what happens is when you store multiple patterns, right? If you store only one, even actually, even if you store one pattern, you mean to store the pattern S, but in the bargain the network also ends up storing some other pattern in addition to S, which we don't want, but it will store that also. It will create a new stable state. So I want, so let's say I want to create a stable state here where here V is equal to S, and that's the only thing I want to create. But in the process, if it creates, right, some half a dozen other states in addition to that, they're all also stable. That's a problem because I, I didn't mean to store all this, right? So it's like, you know, you ask a question in the exam, the student, in addition to writing that, that answer to that question, he writes, right, half a dozen other answers which have no, no connection to the question. So this is something like that, right? So. So these additional states, which became stable because of a, as an artifact, because of a problem with the equations, right? These these uh, other states are called spurious states, and there are several kinds of spurious states. The simplest of them, very easy to explain, very easy to derive mathematically, is called a mirror state. That is, if you try if you try to store a pattern S and make it stable, in the bargain the pattern minus S also becomes automatically stable. Why is that? We can easily see this. 
if s is stable we know that uh, s equal to sorry i am using notation g here g and s sigma are the same okay both mean sigma function sorry about this change in notation so times uh, ws uh, so if so if uh, instead of s let us make it uh, minus s that right? since g is sigma function g of minus x is equal to min minus x right so therefore if you put minus s here the minus goes out and you get minus s on the left side right so basically if s is s is stable it satisfies the equation minus s also satisfies the same equation so we can see it quite trivially. So minus s also becomes stable. So which we don't want, but that's a that's a feature of this network. Similarly, if I store three patterns, S1, S2, S3, right, uh, then construct a kind of a new pattern, which is kind of a mixture of all these three patterns. Uh, let's call it S mix. And this mix, mixed pattern or mixture pattern is uh, defined like this the signum of plus or minus s1 plus or minus s2 plus or minus s3 so take three patterns sum them up like this so you'll actually get eight combinations take any of them they're all these mixture patterns so only thing is uh, this this uh, result is valid only when n is much larger than one n is a large number tending to infinity okay. we're looking at very large but this, this this second result is statistically true first result is always true this mirror state is always true but mixture states are really uh, this is this happens only when we are talking about large networks and uh, s1 are and s is p are random by that what we mean is a given bit right uh, si being equal to say plus one the probability of that is equal to 0.5 so si being equal to minus one is also 0.5 so uh, so the, there is no bias in the in the bit value, the bit value. So under those conditions, this is valid. So you see that. Uh, so I won't go through the proof, but basically what happens is, under those conditions, if S1, S2, and S3 are stable, S mix also ends up being stable. So that means if three patterns you, you try to store, you end up store you know stabilizing three mirror sets minus S1, minus S2, minus S3. In addition, you will be stabilizing eight mixture states. Okay, so all of them will be stable. And so, which is a problem. In, and in addition to these two classes of Fourier states, there's a third class which is much larger. These are called spin class states. These are stable states which are not correlated with the stored pattern. So, in this case, the the mixture states are reasonably correlated with the stored pattern. The stored pattern is SP. This is a mixed state. The dot product is n by 2, which is right. If it's fully correlated, it, the dot product should be n. Here it's only n by 2, which is reasonably correlated. But in spin glass states, there's no correlation at all, but they'll also be stable. Um, this is again valid for a large network. So statistically, this is a valid result. So, because of all these problems, so right, when you store some patterns and retrieve it, uh, if you store too many patterns, the network will start making errors. And what happens is the rate at which errors occur, right, uh, increases rapidly beyond a certain number of stored patterns. And that number turns out to be this value, 0.138. So take, if P is the number of stored pattern, N is the number of neurons. If P by N is 0.138, right, that's about, if you have a, a network of 100 neurons, that's about 13, 14 patterns, which is not very high. Right, I mean, in a network of 100 neurons, you are only able to store about 13, 14 patterns. If it reliably, if you start storing 15, 16, and more, it's, your retrieval error will start increasing very rapidly because uh, bifurcation occurs at this point. So after that, there is a rapid increase in retrieval error. So this result was obtained using statistical mechanics, right? Because the original motivation for optical network is thin glass uh, systems, right? The magnetic materials. So therefore, and, um, all that was all that comes from statistical mechanics. And Hopfield, in his original paper, uh, did a lot of simulations and has found that the capacity is about 0.15. But uh, more careful theoretical calculations uh, got the number 0.138, so about roughly 0.14. Now, to improve capacity. <coughs> 
there are certain hacks. Uh, there are also a lot of other uh, variations of open networks which were proposed later to improve capacity. But we won't be looking at all that. We'll be looking at uh, only a biological implication of open network very soon. So to improve memory capacity, one hack that people use is to reset or uh, you know set the uh, self loop self weights to zero. So WIA is the weight of a neuron to itself. These are set to zero because a large value of WIA will tend to stabilize every state. You know, to understand that, let us see this extreme case. Let us see consider the case when WIA is all because we know we have said earlier that it should be positive. Uh, this should be positive. To make sure that the energy function is right, it decreases at every every update. So let us assume that WIA is a large positive number, like much greater than one. Then what happens is uh, the sigma WIA V so WIJ so sigma WIJ VJ term which is used in the update rule can be approximated by simply W I I V I because this is a very large number. This term dominates everybody else. And it's positive, right? So and so therefore, uh, sigma or oh, sorry, sigma of W I I V I simply equals V I. W I is a large positive number. The so sigma is sigma function, so it's equal to V I. So which means every state is stable. Right, uh, no matter what your VI is, uh, that's what is uh, that comes out as output. Because basically, what is happening here is only the IA term dominates, other terms don't dominate, and right? all the other interaction terms you know get neglected. So, every state becomes uh, stable, which is uh, which means what a lot. So, every state is a spurious state, which is you know, so if you have 100 neurons, so if you have n neurons, then there are two power n states. Okay, and every state is stable. So, so the thing is that's why it, uh, open network capacity is very poor because if they have an index memory uh, with uh, with address having n bits, I can store two power n memories, right? Whereas an open network uh, with n neurons can only store not even n. So, can only store 0.138 n n uh, patterns. So, which therefore the memory capacity is very low. But uh, why are we interested in this, and why are we even considering this? If the memory capacity is very low uh, compared to index memory, index memory you have to have perfect address to, re to retrieve the memory, right? And uh, I cannot retrieve the con if I cannot give contents as input and retrieve the address, it doesn't make any sense at all in index memory. But whereas in the in the Hopfield network, I can give a part of this binary vector. This pattern as input and get the re remaining uh, remaining part as, uh, as output. I can give any part and get any remaining part, assuming that the part I'm giving as a probe is sufficiently large in the overall pattern. So that so these kinds of memories are also called content addressable memories. So that's what is nice about Hopfield network. This is what is nice about Hopfield network in comparison to the index memory. Index memory doesn't have this kind of feature. So to get this kind of a new feature, which is not in index memory, we are foregoing some performance in terms of memory capacity. So let's look at a small numerical example to see how this memory works. So let us say I'm, I want to store this pattern S equal to 1, 1, minus 1, transpose. So, so N is equal to 3. It's a three neuron network. And therefore, the weight matrix is equal to SS transpose, which is equal to this. So 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1. And you can quickly notice that this is a symmetric matrix. Because outer product gives you a symmetric matrix and uh, Hopfield network requires W to be symmetric. So both are consistent. So now I take a slightly distorted vector. Instead of taking 1, 1, minus 1, which is a correct answer, I'm taking 1, 1, 1, right, uh, as initial condition. So now let, let me update only the first bit. Vi, so Vi, uh, so V1, so V1 zero is one, so V1 uh, one. Let me calculate V1 one, which is equal to sigma of right at Wij Vj at t. So that will be dot product of right the first row and the this vector. So one times one, one times one, minus one times one. So if I do that, I get 
uh, argument is one, so sigma one this is one. So it continues to be one. So now let me update bit two, right? So v two of one, which is equal to again, if you apply the same rule, this will be the dot product between the, this current state and the second row, right? Uh, that will be one times one, one times one, minus one times one. <coughs> this is also one, so there's no change. Now let me try to update the third bit. So just notice that just because I try to update doesn't mean it will get updated, right? It need not. So if I do that, in the third case, I have sigma of minus one times one, minus one times one. This, this is because it's dot product with the third row. Minus one times one, minus one times one, and minus and one times one. In this case, the argument became minus one, right? So therefore, our output is minus one. So V3 now became went from one to minus one. So you know, and so the next step, the initial condition is one one minus one, and if you apply this initial condition update again, you you will now notice that it won't change any further. That means the network has stabilized, and you see you can easily see that you are you're able to retrieve the correct pattern perfect. So you can do the same thing with uh, larger networks. Uh, let me just show you a simulation. In this network, uh, two patterns are stored. This is a picture of a girl called Lena, a well-known picture in a lot of computer vision, image processing, uh, literature. So you see that you're probing the network with this small patch. Let me start again. So this is the complete picture. This will be stored in, stored in the network. Then as initial condition, I'm only giving this small patch. Slowly, it is filling up the remaining part. Okay, and retrieving the correct picture. And in spite of adding noise to 10% of the weights, it's able to retrieve well. Here, I'm adding noise to 50% 50, 50 of the weight. It's still able to retrieve very well. Because there's so much redundancy in the weights. Right, because I have taken a vector of size n and distributing it over weights, over n square weights. There's a lot of redundancy. But when we add 90% weights, you see that it's messing up. It's not able to retrieve well, which is good. I mean, this, but it has to go wrong somewhere or other. With 90% noise, most of the weights are wrong. Now, let us try to retrieve the second image. Here also, I'm <clears throat> giving some part of the forehead of Mona Lisa. It's able to retrieve very well, even with 10% noise. Same thing with 50% noise. It's able to retrieve very well. See, so as you add more noise, it is, takes longer to retrieve. You can still see the outline of uh, Mona Lisa. I think the other pattern stored is a football, uh, if I remember right. So it is, you can see the outline of a football, right, which is getting superimposed on Mona Lisa. It's not able to, uh, because so many weights are gone, so it is uh, getting confused. Okay, so so that's all for today. Next class, I will look at an uh, extension of Hopi Network called the Continuous Hopi Network. With this, we'll be able to make contact with uh, one of the popular theories of how hippocampus works, right? Uh, so let us start.